Okay, howdy. 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 How is everyone today? Good. Happy fall. Are y'all as excited as I am about fall? I mean, I pulled out my cardigan already and my booties. I'm like, hey, bring it on. I'm ready for this cooler weather. So I just want to welcome all of you today who are here in person and through TTVN. Thank you for joining us for Nutrition Through the Life Cycle. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation by Megan Windham, registered dietitian from Butyl Health Center. Um, if you all have any questions, comments, concerns after this presentation, please see myself or Megan afterwards, and we'll be more than happy to answer anything you all have. Please join us next week in person or uh, live through TTVN for new healthy aging, same time, same place, and I'm going to give it to Megan. Help me welcome Megan today. Thank you. Thank you, and howdy. 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 Um, I'm excited to be here as well, and we have a nice little group here to, to, to talk through nutrition through the life cycle. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Megan Windham. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian, and I work in the Beetle Health Center. So I see students regularly. Um, I don't see a lot of young students, but I have um, a little 17-month-old at home, another one on the way. So this is a very near and dear topic to me, just talking about infancy on, but also looking at adolescent, teen, even um, older adults. Next week's focus will be a little bit more on the elderly population, so we'll cover some of it today, but not go um, in depth as much. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we go throughout this as well. This is meant to be informal. Ask your questions about maybe your own family members, friends, things that you've been wondering as well. Okay, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about nutrition for all stages of life, and the neat thing about nutrition is that it kind of changes as we go throughout life. Um, so as we start off in infancy, that's a whole different ball game than toddler, than even adolescent, than even our older adults. And I'll focus on some of those key nutrients that we want to make sure we're getting in those different um, life cycles as well. Okay? So we'll go through newborn, infant, toddler, uh, preschool, middle, middle school, pre-adolescent, adolescent, adolescent old, and then adult, and then our aging adult. Um, so nutrition for the, the newborn, we always hear um, breast is best or breast milk is best. Um, I'll tell you too, just as, uh, you know, having a 17-month-old at home, you know, as a dietitian, that was important to me. But um, I struggled a lot with breastfeeding and trying to figure that out. No one ever tells you how difficult and hard that can be. Um, so there are times for supplementation, most definitely. I would never recommend against supplementation or not choosing breast milk if that's an option for you um, because they've come a long way in that. Um, but at the end of the day, breast milk is still best if we can. Um, the reason for that, it contains a lot of our amino globulins, our fatty acids, um, our proteins, our calciums, our many different vitamins. Um, lipid values, but our formulas do very similar things as well. So please don't feel like you have to choose breast milk or if you didn't breastfeed your children or um, have family members who did not, that it's a bad thing. It's still okay. Um, but these are the reasons why that is the best for infancy. Um, usually our recommendation here too is till six months of age to exclusively breastfeed or provide that milk. And at six months, we would want to introduce some of our pureed type foods. Um, you can see the list here of what that might look like. At six to eight months, six infants can eat soft, lumpy foods. This would be infant cereals, smooth applesauce, sweet potato mash. I put on here pureed meats too, and this was one of some of the first things that we fed our child because at six months, if they're not getting as much breast milk or even as much formula, they're not getting as much iron. So iron is fortified in our formulas for the most part. That's why you see iron fortified cereals for infants. Um, meats in particular too have a great source of iron and many infants are iron deficient, but we don't know that or don't test that till they're one. Um, so this is something that I would strongly encourage and there's a lot of research behind brain development and even just um, iron deficiencies with pureed meats. At eight to 10 months, we're looking at more soft minced foods. So this would be some things with a little bit of texture, cottage cheese, small pastas, um, mashed banana instead of pureed banana. So we're looking a little bit of a chunky texture. At nine to 12 months, this would be a little bit more. They're starting to form some of those teeth, pieces of toast, cheese cubes, things that they can actually chew here. And really once we get to about um, 12 to 18 months, 
I always encourage, tell them to eat what you're eating. And so that's something that it helps not only the family's diet, but also the, the children's diet to get that variety and not feel like they have to eat a certain way and you have to eat a certain way here. Um, nutrition for the toddler and preschooler. So toddler would be one to three years old. That's what we classify this as. This is where we really get into those strong preferences, likes and dislikes. I joke a lot of times because our little son at home, one day he'll love um, the meat that we cooked for him, and then the next day he wants nothing to do with it. So it's kind of that guessing game of what they like, what they don't. Um, food jacked, aversions. Um, but what we try to do, or what I really try to emphasize, is to serve a favorite food with some of those foods that they're not really sure about. Um, so, like, for example, if your child really loves fruit, which ours does, he will eat any type of fruit you put out. But if we put something else out there with that, he's more than likely to try both of those. He may not eat the whole serving of the carrots that are out there, but he may eat that. He will eat the fruit. So if we pair those together, it helps a little bit. Um, the preschooler, three to five years old, this is when um, we start imitating the eating behaviors of others. So what, whoever they're around is really important to think about. And I would challenge you as a family or as um, if you've raised kids before too, um, they, they like to do what you're doing. So if you're eating your whole food, they're going to eat it. If you're eating vegetables, they'll do that. So really encouraging healthy behaviors here. Um, really from one to three, they're eating a lot. I say sometimes my son will eat more than I do at times because he's just growing and growing rapidly. Three to five, it slows down a little bit. So you're not going to see that they're eating as much. They may go a meal and just not have much at that time. That's completely appropriate and it's just a decreased appetite there. Um, but what's key here is that they're doing a lot of activity. So they're running around a lot. They're moving a lot. Um, they're crazy, probably chasing them all over. Um, so we want nutrient dense, but higher calorie. So what that means are things like um, nuts, nut butter. If they're allergic to that, maybe we're looking at something like hummus or avocado, adding a little bit of higher calorie foods to their intake, um, not necessarily all the little snacks. And um, it's funny that when we talk about snacks, we were recently in Colorado and there was a family hiking around us and there were two young kids and the dad said, I don't know what's with all this snacking. And he was just joking about his kids just snack all the time and they can snack all day. But if we think about a lot of snacks that we eat, it's goldfish, it's pretzels, it's chips. It's things that are easy to grab and go for a lot of these kids, but they're very nutrient poor. And so we've got to try to get in some of those higher calorie or nutrient dense type foods when we can. And that's something to keep in mind for this particular age group. Questions on that infant, toddler? No. Okay. Um, all right. So toddlers with food. So up to the age of three, they, three, they have the innate ability con to control when they're hungry and when they're not. Um, this is one thing we're all born with. We're all born with, I'm full, I'm satisfied, I'm hungry, I'm not. As we get older, we lose that a little bit. And you can find yourself there a lot of times. If there's a plate of cookies out and you've just eaten lunch, a toddler would say, well, I'm full. I don't really need anything. But us, we go, yeah, I'm hungry for some sweets. I'll eat some more. <laughs> and we lose that sense of hungerness and fullness. Um, but for them, they're born with that. And so we have to listen and trust that. And that's one thing I think I learned the hard way, too, was, okay, well, they're not eating. We need to give them more. We need to um, try something. But they know when they're hungry and full, and they'll eat when they're hungry if they need that. So I'm um, trying to tr trust that for them. Um, so avoid trying to tell them to clean their plate, that you have to finish this, especially at these ages, too. They will get what they need when they need it, as long as we're providing that quality food for them. And that's really the key of it. If we're giving them just chips, crackers, cookies all the time, yeah, they're going to fill up on that, but the nutrients aren't there. When we give them a plate of dinner with rich nutrients, fruits, vegetables, grains, and meat, they may not be hungry to eat that. So now we're not, they're not getting in the key nutrients that they need. Um, so keep in mind um, that that's our role here. Um, children will usually have a preference for sweet and slightly salty foods. Sweet in particular, if you think about breast milk or formula, it's made to be a little bit sweeter. Certainly they're not adding sugar to it, but that's just our taste buds. And so that's why a lot of them like fruits starting out or enjoy the puree type um, bananas, fruits, that type of thing. And even slightly salty foods. And I'm always surprised that like last night, 
I put a pickle on Reed's little tray and he will eat 10 or 12 pickles. And he's 17 months old, but he loves to do that. So um, the saltiness of that per se is what he enjoys, um, but it's something that they're all different. Fish being one thing too is a great first starter food, especially for toddlers. It's a little bit easier to chew um, and they, it's, it's softer on their mouth, especially if they're going through teething or things like that. Um, energy dense foods are great as well. Um, they, they like the preference for it. So if we can make mac and cheese a little bit healthier by whole grain pasta, if we can add some of our own um, cheeses to it instead of maybe the processed type cheeses, that would be an idea. Pizza, we could add different veggies to the pizza. So more of this that we can do helps. Um, but in general, we see a lot of media influenced ads. So we see McDonald's, we see boxes of cereal with a lot of different cartoons and things like that on there. So a lot of these kids are going to want that. Um, I think about even daycare. So when they go to daycares, the other kids bring things that we they, they see. And so they're influenced by many different things. And it's not our jobs as parents to make it so strict to where they can't eat things. But it's also important for us to realize what that role is for us and how those so social influences can play a part not only in their thoughts or wants, but as a parent, what's easy, what's simple, and what's quick. Um, here again, parental influence by restricting, rewarding, serving, size, and pressuring. I would encourage no, um, to, to try not to reward with food. So, hey, you did great tonight. Let's go get ice cream. Um, you can have dessert if you finish your plate. That just kind of sets up that mentality a little bit more of I have to finish everything especially in this stage, they know when they're hungry and they know when they're full. And so if we tell them you have to finish everything before you can get this, sometimes that leads us to where we are today of, well, we finish everything before we get something and now we've overeaten too. Okay, questions on that? All right. Um, so make food fun. And I am certainly not the mom that sends things like this, I'll tell you that. Um, as a dietitian, too, it's important for me, for our family to eat healthy, but we have to be realistic with this. Um, I like this image, too, just for the perspective of, yes, it's great to think about making food fun, but it doesn't have to look like this to have them eat it. Um, my biggest recommendation is to get them in the kitchen with you. Have them see what you're eating. Have them cut something up. Have them um, snap green beans. Have them pull things apart. Stir in a bowl. Um, the more you can get them involved at this age too, the more they will start to enjoy these types of things. Um, certainly you could get creative with different things here like your apples, your string cheese. Um, say they don't really like boiled egg, but they like cheddar cheese. That's a combination that we could add there and pairing that together. Um, so certainly we could do things like this to encourage healthful eating, but also have them enjoy what they're doing too. Um, picky eater. So this is a big question I get a lot of, well, my child is picky. And this is not even just toddlers. This can be anywhere up to adolescents or older. Um, and so I think a lot of it starts with infancy and at the age, how much are they exposed to? What are they given? But even if we haven't done well with that, I think there's a time and place that we can think about in the future what we can do to improve that. Um, so try to avoid food wars. Well, you have to eat this. This is what I'm forcing you to eat, kind of giving that, that justification there. Um, allow them to determine when they're hungry. Here again, when they're hungry, they'll truly let you know. It doesn't have to be a you eat here or we don't eat at all. Um, try to offer many different options too. And here again, it's that combination. So if they love carrots, and ranch dressing, maybe we throw in celery and tomatoes occasionally. They may never eat it, but it's there and the choices are there for them. So the more we can offer for them, the better within reason. It doesn't have to be a huge smorgasbord of food. Um, introduce new or less popular foods um, with their favorite foods. So maybe it's mac and cheese with spinach or mac and cheese with cauliflower in it. So we're blending different foods or actually um, encouraging that. Um, one thing you may have seen a lot too is that we can hide vegetables in food. Certainly I think that that's a good way to get vegetables in, but it's not something that I would always encourage either because you want them to understand why they're eating it and what's, what it is important for. But if you have a child who just refuses to eat a stalk of broccoli, it's okay to put it in things um, certainly and it makes them understand that hey, it's in here, but I also like this mac and cheese and I'm going to eat it. So um, it's certainly something that I would encourage. 
You may find that all the spinach is picked out on the side of this if they're eating it, and that's okay, but keep trying it again. Um, the recommendation is at least 10 exposures before you say, look, they just don't like it. And if we can really stay consistent with the 10 exposures, we find that usually a few of those foods are some things that they're gonna actually eat. Um, here again, keep bringing the, the food, keep bringing back food, they most likely will not like it the first time. And I've said that over and over and too, when we try things and try things and it's like, okay, well, I don't think they like it. And it's frustrating, it seems wasteful as a parent, it seems wasteful um, just with budget resources, but even if it's just small amounts, we can keep trying that and incorporating it, it's helpful for these um, little guys to eat. Okay, so for the young, here's some nutrients of concern we want to make sure we're getting in. Um, first and foremost, calcium and vitamin D. That's why you'll see a lot of times when we start weaning off of formula or breast milk at 12 to 18 months, we replace that or try to encourage more of our calcium and vitamin D fortified cow's milk. And we would look for those that are whole milk. And the recommendation is whole milk um, at least under two. At two, you can switch to a lower fat milk if you choose. Um, but the recommendation right now is the whole milk. Um, so we need this to build bones. We need this um, because in the past, rickets was a disease that was from lack of vitamin D, and that's why vitamin D now is in our milk and dairy products. So great source of nutrients for kids, and usually kids will, will adapt to this pretty well. If there is a milk allergy, certainly soy milk would be a great alternative. There's other milk alternatives as well, but our soy milk has a great source of protein in it. Um, so I would look at that as being a better alternative. <clears throat> um, vitamin K is supplemented to all babies at birth, so we don't have to worry about that so much. But as we get older, we need to make sure we're getting in some greens, leafy greens, that type of thing. Um, iron, I've mentioned this already too. Um, exclusively breastfed infants, don't. there's no iron in the breast milk per se. Um, yes, it will transfer a little bit for what the mom eats, but not a huge amount. It's always for, supplemented in our formulas, but not in breast milk. So here again, that's why the recommendation is to supplement with um, foods that are rich in iron. It helps deliver oxygen. This would be in the form of beans as well. So black beans, kidney beans, pinto beans have iron in it if your child is not good with eating meat or wants to eat much meat. Um, for the child, pre-adolescence and adolescence. So when we're looking at this, this is kind of breaking down the next classification. But before I go to this, does anyone have questions about infancy, toddler, three, five years old? Any questions? Good. Okay. Um, so when we look at our middle childhood, this is five to ten. Um, so five to ten year old, the growth slows except for mid growth spurt. And this is usually between the ages of four and eight. So keeping that in mind, if you have any kids in this range or grandchildren or nieces, nephews, you can see that that's where our growth spurt is going to occur. Our pre-adolescence um, body image and dieting first appears here. Um, I can't tell you how many of my eating disorder patients will come in and say, and I'll ask, well, when did you notice some eating behaviors change? And they'll say, I was 10 years old. I was eight years old. Um, so I'm seeing it younger and younger. A lot of that, I think, is social media influenced. I think a lot of it is just environmental, what we're seeing. Some of it can be parent pressure at home. Some of it can be that forced eating perspective. Um, so that's something to keep in mind here. And then our adolescence is 11 to 21. This is really where a lot of our growth occurs. This is where a lot of our key nutrients are important, especially for bone health. Um, so our bone mass is doubling. Really what we say is females in particular, by the time we're 25, 30, we're not developing any more bone mass. We're not storing any more or making any more. So if we're deficient in calcium, vitamin D, going on a strict diet, restricting these things, we can be at risk for osteoporosis because we just truly don't make any more. Um, so our peak weight gain coincides with our usually our linear growth, so we're seeing up and out growth. And then um, a key recommendation here is females require at least 15% body fat for normal menstrual function and hormone function <coughs> and um, need 25% to maintain. So we do body composition too in our department and when I see a female coming in with 12, 13, right at 14%, usually it's lack of menstrual cycle as well. So those adolescents or preteens here who aren't gaining the proper amount of weight, who are maybe over-exercising, not eating enough, 
<coughs> we see lack of body fat in those as well. So something to keep in mind, we don't, eating fat doesn't necessarily equate to body fat. That's a common misconception here. It's just getting enough calories to meet the demands of higher energy needs. Questions on that? <coughs> so factors on eating preferences here. So we used to see it um, as, as we just looked in toddler, at, um, pre-adolescence, kind of our younger population. That was more just preferences. That was more what mom and dad gave me, maybe some taste here as well. But here now our preferences are some of our parent role in mo modeling. Certainly I think this makes a big impact and mom and dad go through the drive through every single night to eat or never cook a meal at home. That's something that I see a lot of my teens um, eating fast food all the time because they don't know how to cook or mom and dad never prepared anything or they don't know even where to start. So that's certainly um, a factor. Social media is huge here. Um, I have a lot of uh, my patients are pre-adolescents too. When I previously was at Texas Children's working with a lot of younger adolescents, I say I kind of work with older adolescents now, but the younger 12 to, to 18 um, at Texas Children's, we saw a lot of social media. So they're looking at Instagram accounts for recipes or body image ideas or trends or diet fads. So we're seeing that, um, which impacts body image and self-esteem. And so I see that over and over. Um, I'll even tell you to a lot of my so, um, eating disorder patients or those who struggle with that, some of the recommendations I give them is to delete their Instagram account to stop looking at some of that. And so social media can play a big influence in that. Um, busy lifestyle, certainly fast food, on the go, lack of nutrient dense foods, and lack of good quality food. Our peers, really what our roommates are eating, what our boyfriends, girlfriends, friends are eating. I see that over and over, just other types of relationships that influence someone one way or the other, good or bad. It can lead them to really restrictive eating patterns and healthy, or it can lead them to overeating fast food and less healthy. And then culture in particular here. So this is um, kind of what I would say is the launching pad to adulthood. So whatever students or adolescents are doing in this time phrase and, and period, usually it's what they end up doing in adulthood. And so we see that now in college campuses. We see it in our young adults and even high school and even those in our older populations. Um, so sugar becomes a bigger factor here too. Um, we see sugar sweetened beverages at schools, um, home, work sites, athletic events, vending machines. It's a lot more accessible. Maybe in that toddler stage, parents controlled that. They didn't keep sodas in the house. They didn't keep juices in the house. Now it's a free game. So we're seeing a lot of high school teens going by a convenience store on the way home, going by a, a restaurant on the way home. So we're seeing that there. Um, sugars associated certainly, as many of you know here, with overweight, obesity, diabetes, um, elevated blood lipids, heart disease, cavities. There's so much that goes on with too much sugar consumption. And so we're seeing that a lot, especially in this population. Um, Overweight and obesity prevalence in adolescents is increasing, and you can see here 18.5% of children or adolescents are classified as obese. And that's a significant amount. If we showed you kind of the obesity graphic of just our population in general, how that's changed over time, we're seeing it more and more and younger and younger. And if you remember what I said about this population, it's the launching pad for what they do in adulthood. And so what they're doing now is really turning into a long-term diet approach. So nutrients of concern for the adolescent. So what do we want to look for here? Um, calcium, certainly, because as I mentioned, this is a peak time for bone mass and growth. Um, so a lot of my patients and even those that would be younger, if you have any of those relatives, family members, or friends, I would highly encourage um, dairy, yogurt, cheese, three times a day to get in our calcium and vitamin D consumption for bone health and bone development. It's critical for bone mass, and like I said, 50% of calcium storage is built up during this time. Once we get to about 25, 30, our storage is gone, and then as we know with postmenopausal, we lose a lot of that bone mass as well. Iron, um, so iron here is greatest for the female, especially after menarche. So if you think of menstrual cycle, losing blood mass, iron is stored in our blood. So this is a really critical time that we see more anemia, 
iron which means iron deficiency so we want to make sure that we're getting enough iron in this will be found in our red meats this will be found in our beans this can be found in some nuts and seeds but in particular our lean red meats are a great source to get that in um, so great for us there um, I always encourage a lot of my athletes, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the athletic presentation, but those who are running a lot, doing a lot, in order to feel better, remember iron transports oxygen. And so if we have low iron levels, we're going to feel gas. We're going to feel tired all the time when we're exercising. So increased iron levels can help with feeling better too. Um, folate here, so low levels of folate can lead to early um, reproductive troubles later on. Um, if you're concerned about folate levels, leafy greens, green vegetables are a great way to get it in. A general multivitamin would be a great thing as well if your um, daughter or son is not getting enough of that in. And inadequate consumption currently seen of all these vitamins, minerals, and fiber is really what we're seeing in this population. So as I mentioned, they're going to fast food, they're grabbing things on their own, they're making their own choices. Maybe mom and dad aren't preparing all these things again. Um, so we see lack of dietary fiber. They're eating white breads, white pasta, refined type grains. They're not getting as many fruits and vegetables here. They're not getting dairy in. Um, they're maybe not eating school lunch anymore where the milk was provided and now it's not. So we're getting some different changes there. Um, snacks for teenagers. Um, so we'll kind of go through either of these because the question I get a lot too is, well, what would be a healthy snack and then the second question is, well, I really don't want to gain weight. I need to lose weight, or I do need to gain weight for a lot of my male patients who struggle with that, and female patients. Um, I certainly see, it, it's surprising that most people think, well, don't you see a lot of people wanting to lose weight? I do, but about a third of that is wanting to gain weight or needing to gain weight for just health reasons. So um, for gaining, we can do something like a peanut butter chocolate protein smoothie. Um, cereal and yogurt bar and a lot of these uh, recipes are going to be in the links to your presentation so at the very end of the presentation there's all these little links you can click on those and see the, the recipes too so higher a little bit higher protein energy bites are great too you probably have seen a lot of these maybe on Pinterest or friends or family members have done them great for needing to gain weight they're calorie dense they have nuts nut butter oats maybe a little bit of protein may have a little bit of chocolate dried fruits, all great energy gaining ideas. Um, hummus is kind of a hot new food too. It's not just made with chickpeas and oil anymore. We're making it into chocolate hummus, ranch hummus, avocado hummus. So there's a ton of different things that we can do with that. And a lot of kids love to dip things. So dip it in ketchup, dip it in sauce, dip it in hummus. So we can change things up with that too for wanting to gain a little bit of weight. Um, for slimming down, so we're looking here again, calcium, vitamin D, our strawberry and almond yogurt bites. Um, apple donuts, so instead of a fried donut, we can take an apple, slice it down the center, have a ring, and we can add different things to it. We could drizzle it with Greek yogurt and put a little cereal on it. We could drizzle it with peanut butter and add some chocolate chips. So we're looking at just some different varieties there. Um, rainbow kebab, basically fruit on a stick, so something a little different there again. Um, we can use fresh fruit, we can use canned fruit, we can use frozen fruit for this, so that would be an easy alternative there. Um, frozen grapes is another great, we're getting into the fall, so that's maybe a little bit of a cooler treat, but a lot of my patients and a lot of young kids that I, I work with enjoy the frozen grapes, so they just wash grapes, throw them in the freezer, and they have a whole different texture to them. Um, Nuts and dried fruit, trail mix, portion size is key with this, about a fourth of a cup is a serving. And then we can look at some of our um, carrot or veggie chips here. And when I say veggie chips, be careful of the ones you buy in the store. Those are a lot of times just basically potato chip with some um, carrot powder, beet powder. So you're losing a little bit more than nutrients. What I would encourage here is to take a whole sweet potato, slice it, roast it in the oven. You don't have to do much to it till it turns a little bit crispy, and that's a great alternative there. Kale's the same thing. You can bake that in the oven or roast it in the oven um, to make great little chips there. So just being mindful of what we're buying always in the store. Um, another tip that's not on here, too, is, is I like to take a banana, cut it in just little rounds, put a little bit of peanut butter in the middle, dip half of it in chocolate, and then freeze it. 
And those are great little bites for after school or even something that you're doing. Um, could be either way. Certainly you could add more peanut butter and chocolate to make it higher calorie. You could add a little bit less of either to make it lower calorie. So something easy there. And then you could also do smoothies too. Smoothies can be made the night before, put in the freezer the week before. Those are great things to include more fruit and vegetables in our diet. Questions on snacks? Yes. I have a question about sure. iron. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it not very healthy? I think that's an answer, but to eat like organ meat, so like liver, I like liver mm -hmm. and, and like chicken gizzards and livers. And, yeah. You know, no, good, that, good question. Great. So the question was about organ meats and iron and just health in general. Would that be good? You know, there's a lot of great benefits in organ meats, iron being one of those, um, nutrients, huge amounts of zinc and iron, and even just um, protein content too. Most people just don't like them. Um, the one thing I would suggest, if you have any history of gout or um, any type of condition that's related to gout, which is the inflammation of your joints from uric acid, Organ meats have a lot of uric acid in them, so I would avoid it for that. But for other reasons, yes, it's fine to include in your diet in a great way. Liver in particular is a great source of iron. We just don't eat it very much. But if you like it, it's great to include. Yes, good question. Other questions? Okay, um, so what stage are you? So if we think about this here, um, early adulthood tends to have that renewed interest. We always think for the kids' sake. So um, especially like where I am now, I would say, you know, it's always, well, what does a kid, what do the kids want? What's best for them? We're always thinking about that. Um, as we move to middle adulthood, we are busy, lack of time. Kids are at soccer, at baseball, at events, and we're running around more than we are at home cooking anything. So we have to think about where we are, what can we do that's easy, but also healthful, and we'll talk through that a little bit. Um, the sandwich generation is filled with this multi-generational caregivers with health concerns. So we may have that middle age that's taking care of their parents, but also taking care of their college kid or also taking care of their son or daughter in high school. So we're kind of in the middle taking care of, of different generations with different health needs. And then later adulthood brings us back to focus usually on our own self, our health, our nutrition. And so it kind of comes full circle into what we're thinking about here but I want you to just kind of think about where you are in that stage and how you've come wherever you've been from the, the bottom up and where you'd like to go as far as nutrition goes here. Um, so for the adult, our growth usually stops in the 20s. Like I said, our calcium bone mass usually is ending by 30s. Um, bone density declines after age 30. Um, these important micronutrients, especially after age 30, include calcium, phosphorus, fluoride, magnesium, sodium, and vitamin D. Um, and calcium is low, no longer added to the bone storage. So that's where I would really emphasize for any adolescent, um, anyone really under 20, 21, um, to make sure that we're getting enough calcium, vitamin D. Does not have to be through milk, but yogurts, cheeses, that type of thing would be great. Um, sarcopenia, so this is really where we find, especially in our older adults, this is listing here more 30s to 40s, but we start to just see a decline in our lean body mass. Um, I see a lot of patients too, especially males wanting to increase lean body mass, become toner, become leaner, but as we age, we just generally decline in that. One, a reason because we just don't do as much activity. Um, we may be not eating as much protein. We may not be eating as enough. Females in particular, this is a time that they may be trying to lose weight, go on a diet, lose the baby weight, try to get healthier. But we just said they're busy running around with all these kids or doing different things. So it's hard to find time to exercise, in particular that lean body mass strength training activity. So this is a big one, especially we'll, we'll talk about that in the elderly adult population. Um, so nutrient deficiency influencing sarcopenia, you can see these here. So really getting a wide variety of nutrients in our diet is key. Um, vitamins, minerals, we'll see vitamin D pop up here again. That would be coming from our, our cow's milk or low-fat dairy. Um, so certainly don't stop eating dairy or stop having vitamin D and calcium after 30 because it helps with preventing sarcopenia, but we're not going to add any more to our bone mass here. Okay. Um, so changes that come with time. So uh, females, if we're thinking now a little bit of our middle age, elderly adult, 
decline of estrogen usually happens around 50. So what does that mean? So we talk about menopause, we talk about this happens, we know our changes are happening, um, but this means increased abdominal fat. The reason for that is that we, at 50, we usually, or 50, around 50, we start losing estrogen. So estrogen decreases, we stop having a normal menstrual cycle, the fat is usually stored or goes hand in hand with estrogen, so that means our fat stores go up, and that's when we start to see a little bit of loss of lean body and bone mass. We're not exercising as much. Maybe we're a little bit more in a sedentary lifestyle. We're a little bit more relaxed. We're maybe going out a little bit more with friends. We kind of have that empty nest feeling. So that's what often happens around um, 50. For men, the gradual decline of testosterone is usually after 30. Um, so with that, we start seeing males after 30 that decline in bone and muscle mass. Insulin resistance is present. If, we were, if you were here at the diabetes talk, um, we talked a little bit about insulin resistance and how that can increase weight gain because it's not as effective as it once was. So we start to see males usually have a little bit more of the belly coming out. Females may be all over depending on body shape and type, but that's usually a progression of what happens. As we age too, our metabolic rate decreases. So we're just not burning as many calories. Um, we weren't made to be as active as we're older, so we certainly want to try to stay active, but it's not as active as we were running around as a toddler or a teen. Um, so we have to keep that in mind that our calorie needs aren't as high as what they are in adolescence here. So I mentioned that here, re a reduction in metabolic rate. The key to being resilient and staying healthy is really a wide variety of nutrients, um, moderate um, moderation as far as sweets, alcohol, that type of thing, and balance. Balance in both exercise and some healthier eating patterns. Okay, um, aging adults. So let's talk through this here. Um, we're going to go a lot more in depth when we go to our next presentation of just kind of the elderly adult. But aging adult here, the de gradual decline just in organ function. Um, I was, my grandmother, who still lives at home and lives alone, is 93 on Saturday. So I went and visited her yesterday after I picked up our little son from daycare because her big birthday is coming up. And um, she was like, you know what, I think I'm doing okay. I was like, look, Grandma, you're doing great for 93. And she goes, you think so? I said, oh, yeah, I think you're doing wonderful. But, you know, her, she's forgetting things. And she goes, it bothers me. I forget things. Um, organ function fails, your brain, your heart, your liver, your, uh, your kidneys, those are things that just start to slow down. That's what I told her. I said, your brain is 93 years old. There's a lot going on in there and it's worked a long time. And so we have to really take that into consideration as we age that we don't want to be so hard on our body, but we also have to understand that we're not going to be like we were at 20, 30, 40, or even 50. Um, the decrease in physical activity and just our overall metabolism really results in about 70 to 100 fewer calories per decade. So I would say this is kind of from 50s on, we need about 70 to 100 calories less as we age. Um, we need fewer calorie amounts, but the nutrient demands are still there. So we still need vitamins, we still need minerals. In fact, some of these, and we'll look at those, actually increases, B12 being one of those, because as we age, we don't absorb as much of that. Um, so these are all really key things to keep in mind. Just cutting calories doesn't, isn't always the key to healthy aging. Um, so the CDC suggests that 51% of an individual's longevity depends on lifestyle factors, really such as nutrition and exercise. This is my 93-year-old grandmother who at lunch, it would be a protein, a starch, and three vegetables and a fruit. I mean, that's just how it was. You know, growing up, a sandwich was fine for me, but this needed to be a full meal. And so nutrition is really key for that, and I truly believe it helps impact our lifestyle, not only just on quality of life, but longevity if we want to truly have a healthy lifestyle. Um, exercise is key here, too. Our exercise needs will change, so we may not be able to go to the gym or run a half marathon anymore, but if we can just get up and walk, if we can go to the grocery store and walk up and down aisles, that's a huge um, benefit to these elderly adults here. Um, so when we have a reduced appetite, especially as we age too, and I was, this is just relevant because I was talking to my grandmother about this too, she's very thin and she always says, well, everyone says I'm so thin and I can't gain weight. And I said, well, are you eating? She said, oh yeah, I'm eating. 
but the appetite's a little bit different. It's, you're not doing as much activity, so you don't feel as hungry, and those hunger cues may not be as present for them. Um, so when we look at this, this is kind of a, a balanced plate that we're looking at. You can see certainly still half is fruits and vegetables because we still need those vitamins and minerals. Um, a fourth of that is still our grains. We still have our dairy and we still have our protein, but we're seeing a little bit more of these nutrient-dense foods here in here. You'll see things like peanut butter. You'll see things like avocado. You'll see things like um, our dried fruits. Those are things that, yes, still have nutrients, but they're more dense meaning we don't have to eat as much because it doesn't fill us up as quickly. Um, with age, our taste and smell decline. So our taste buds, if we think about our organs declining with age, our taste buds decline with age. And so we, do, we just have this decreased desire for food and that something may not taste as well. And that's one thing, especially in like um, assisted living facilities, they'll add more seasonings and flavorings to food because those taste buds aren't always there. Um, hunger and society cues weaken. So if we started out as a little one to three year old where we knew exactly when we were hungry or when we not, you can imagine as we're now 70, 80, 90, we're seeing differences here. Um, so our, our hunger weakens. Thirst is another big one. So dehydration is very, very common in elderly adults. Um, we don't feel as thirsty. We may not drink as much. There may be that, gosh, I can't get to the restroom fast enough because now I'm moving slower and that bothers them. Um, so we want to make sure foods that are rich in water, so things like our fruits and vegetables that have more of that, is a great way to get more water in for these elderly adults. And we have a decline in immune function. So that just goes hand in hand if you think about when we hear flu, flu season, it's infants, pregnant, women and elderly adults that are more at risk. Well, if we think about that, it's just a decreased immune system. Things take a lot more time to recover and um, that's where the protein comes in to help with that. Um, so our nutrients of concern, vitamin D being one of those. Vitamin D is certainly found in our milk as we've talked about, but fish is an excellent source of vitamin D. So great nutrients, but excellent vitamin D. We have vitamin E here in our beans and nuts. Vitamin K, our leafy greens, B12. Um, as we age, especially our elderly adults here again, I would say 70 plus, um, our vitamin B12, we just don't absorb it as much. So this is something that's really important to get in. This helps with energy levels, tiredness. A lot of our meats, our organ meats being a big key in that as well. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Our folate or folic acid is another one here again. This is man mainly in our grains, our cereals. Breads have a lot of that in it as well. And then calcium, and these numbers here are the recommendation of what we should be getting. Um, when we have more sodium, so if you think about, okay, our taste buds are declining, we add more salt to foods or we have more seasonings, we need potassium to balance that a little bit. Our heart is a sodium potassium pump. So too much salt is not a good thing and too much potassium isn't either. So if we're eating more seasoned foods or eating more of these flavor-rich foods to taste better, we need more potassium, and that can come in the form of many fruits and vegetables, bananas being a key, avocado another, um, even our potatoes being a great source of that. Okay, um, so when we talk about this too, our vitamin A, pumpkin and sweet potato, pumpkin being re very relevant right now, um, canned pumpkin is perfectly fine. If we can add that to oatmeal, we can add it to smoothies, we can add it to dishes. Um, vitamin B, um, whole grains and meat here, riboflavin. Um, these are all types of B vitamins here, as you can see. Um, and so then we see our different nutrients and sources with this. Um, really, if we look at this, it's key to have a variety. I mentioned our B vitamins, our biotin is beef liver. Any type of liver there is going to be great as well. Um, all of these B vitamins, remember we don't absorb as much as we age, so these are key nutrients that we want to make sure we're getting enough in, and you can see how that impacts our overall health. Questions on that, aging, healthy, elderly adults, good, okay. All right, um, so as we talked about this too, I, I included a lot of these here at the end of the slide or presentation because throughout the presentation, I've talked a lot about folic acid, vitamin D, where that is. This is just kind of a appendix of where these foods would come from. 
So we've talked a lot about vitamin D, but here's where its, its main sources are found in. Vitamin E, we can find that in our nuts and seeds. Our leafy greens in our vitamin K. So you can just refer back to these um, when I send them to you too. Okay, um, calcium here, you can see where we're getting that from. Collard greens and spinach is a nice source of that as well. Um, potassium here too. Our iron, our lean meat, oysters, leafy greens. Again, um, we could add beans to this as well. So black beans, pinto beans, great as well. Um, and then our chloride to tomatoes, celery, leafy greens, as that was on some previous slides. I'll go through these here. Just like I said, so you can have a refresher of what that looks like to you. Okay? You will have all of these on your um, presentation there when you get them. So what questions do you have? Tell me if you have any, and we can go from there. Yeah. Okay, this might be a silly question, but um, I know there's fat-soluble vitamins and water-soluble mm -hmm. vitamins, and I know on the seed you can just keep, you know, because it'll go, but should we ever worry about getting too much of those fat-soluble vitamins? That's a good question. So we do have fat and water-soluble vitamins, um, so the question was, is there too, can we get too much of something? Um, so our fat-soluble are A, D, E, and K, okay, so when we think about that, um, vitamin A is probably one of the ones that I would say is most toxic and we know the most about about overdoing. So I would really never suggest a supplement of vitamin A unless there's truly a deficiency or there's some sort of medical necessity there. Um, vitamin D, we often, most Americans are deficient. We don't do routine lab testing on that, but if you ever went to have that done, you'd probably find that you're low in that. So usually we recommend good sources of food because with food, um, we absorb it differently than a vitamin form. And so we can overdo it, certainly with food. Chances are we won't because it's hard to eat that much at one time. Supplement form is really where we get, we can get too much of that. Um, e and K are found in leafy greens, nuts, seeds. So unless you're eating that all day, every day, you would probably want to be concerned about that, but not necessarily there. Our, all of our other ones are water soluble, so you're exactly right. We, that's why we can take emergency or vitamin C and not worry about it so much. But with a vitamin D supplement, we have to be a little bit more careful. If we're deficient, there's usually a doctor's recommendation or prescription form we would take. If we're just being cautious, there's an over-the-counter that's usually going to be within a guideline there. Um, so we don't have to be overly concerned with that. But certainly if there's a nutrient you're consuming or a food you're consuming over and over and over, plus a supplement of it, I would be a little concerned there. But that's a great question. Other questions? Toddler, adolescent, adult, anything that you're, you've seen or done, family members, friends that you're questioning maybe? Oh, we good? All right. Do you, if you have any other questions that you didn't want to ask in front of the group, please let me know. I'm happy to answer that for you. Um, and then if you have anything else for them, too, they can certainly ask you afterwards. I do have a question. Oh, yeah. Can you send us these, this information like you did before? Yes, I will send them again. Okay. Yep. So you will have that. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Megan. And um, as she said... She'll send me, uh, me the slides and I'll send all registered participants. So make sure you please sign in. And then if anyone through TTVM would like these slides, just please contact us at wellness at tamu.edu and we would be more than happy to send you the slides as well. Um, we also will send the recording link through email. So if y'all have any other questions, just let us know. If not, then y'all have a great day. Thank you.